The following teaching is possible thanks to the friends and partners of Spirit and Truth Fellowship International. In the introduction to this series of teachings on curses, I explained that I have seen that there are three basic categories of curses. The first one is curses that can result from uh, actions. The next one is curses as a result of words. And the third one is curses that are related to ancestral or generational sin. In this session, I want to talk about curses specifically related to actions. And to the, the very best place to do that to begin is in the book of Genesis. So let's go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 and let's look in verse 14 through 17. Here, if you will recall, this is a scene is that the uh, serpent, Satan, is uh, entering into the Garden of Eden. The word Eden merely means the Garden of Delights. And he's basically presented a temptation to Eve. Now, as a result of Eve's actions and Adam's actions, a curse occurs. And the principle that we're looking at is that our actions can result in curses. So, Genesis chapter 3, verse 14. So the Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, because you have tempted the woman, that was the serpent's action, cursed are you above all the livestock, all the wild animals, you will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. The point being, the serpent, Satan, did something, his action resulted in him being cursed. So too, the woman, in verse 16, God says, I will greatly increase your pains, your, your pains in childbearing. With pain you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Part of the result of Eve's actions was that she became cursed in the sense that she has painful childbirth. And every woman can testify, and every man who's been in the delivery room can testify, childbirth is painful. So here it is, Eve's actions result in a curse. And the other thing that happened is, Adam in the same way, you can read the record, I don't want to belabor the point, but in the same way, now all of a sudden he has to sweat from his brow to produce his food from the earth. That's a consequence as the result of his uh, sin, his actions, his, something that he did. And two, in verse 17, God tells Adam that the ground, as a result of his actions, are now cursed. Let's look at this record. Genesis 3, 17. To Adam he said, God said, Because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. That's about as specific as you can get. What was the result of that cursing that happens on the ground? It says, God says it will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your brow. You will eat your food until you return to the ground. Thorns and thistles were not the natural state that God had started his creation, this world, with. Specifically, genetic modification occurred. I don't believe God did that. God created the world and everything in it was good. But when Adam, because of his sin, he gave the dominion and control that he had over to God's arch enemy, Satan. That was one of the consequences of Adam's sin. Let's look in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19. It says, we know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Now it doesn't get too much more specific than that. The whole world is under the control of the evil one. Well, you have to ask yourself, back in Genesis, Adam had dominion and control over the whole world. But now here God clearly says in 1 John 5:19, the whole world is under the control of the evil one which means that something's happened. Adam has transferred that over to God's enemy, Satan, the serpent. And that was one of the consequences of Adam's actions. 
that basically the earth became cursed. It allowed an entry point for the enemy, for God's enemy, to gain access. And the result was he took over control of the world and then he produced genetic modification. You know as well as I do, if you look at a rose, it's a beautiful flower and it smells great. But if you grab that thing too hard, you're going to find that it's got thorns and thistles. You know, it's got, you're going to stick your hand because it's been basically an imperfect flower now as a result of the curse that's upon earth. It's like taking a beautiful masterpiece like the Mona Lisa and then all of a sudden someone throwing some iced tea or stained ink across it. You can still see it's a, it's a beautiful picture, but it's been marred. And that's what happens. The, our actions can allow for curses to occur. It can't be any more clear than some of these records that I want to read. But I do want to remind each and every one of us, as I said in the intro, this can be kind of a creepy topic. So really what we have to be careful of is keep in mind that Jesus Christ has broken the power of curses. That doesn't mean curses can't occur, but they can and will have no effect as long as we break the power of those curses by applying the blood of Christ and rebuking them. Let's look in Genesis chapter 4. Since we're already in Genesis, it's an easy place to go. So Genesis chapter 4, verse 10, at the last part of this record, it says, your brother's blood, speaking of Abel, and God is addressing Cain here. He says, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. You are, now you are under a curse and driven from the ground. What happened? Cain murders his brother and God says, now you're under a curse. See, our actions can result in curses. Deuteronomy 27.15 Cursed is the man who carves an image or casts an idol. The action of carving an image, casting an idol, produces a curse. It allows an entry door to be opened for, for demonic spirits, evil spirits, to gain influence or access against a person, whether that person be Christian or otherwise. That's the principle that I'm trying to point out here. Um, and also, just as a side note, you know, we tend to think of a lot of times as idols being statues that people bow down to and all that stuff. Ezekiel tells us clearly that really the issue with idols, they're idols of the heart. It's where we're putting our heart. And anytime we put something ahead of God, it, from God's perspective, is considered an idol. So I believe idolatry can absolutely open the door for evil spirits to, to affect, to interfere, to harass, to whatever. But the point is, it produces a curse, and a curse is nothing more than an entryway of an evil spirit into a person's life. Also, Deuteronomy 27.16, dishonoring of parents. Cursed is the man who dishonors his parents or mother. And then in verse 17, cursed is the man who moves his neighbor's boundary stone. Now, what is, what, what's the significance of moving a boundary stone? You're defrauding your neighbor. That's, in essence, what you're doing. There's a boundary stone. It gives a clear delineation, my property versus another's. I move the boundary stone. Well, I'm not moving it, you know, against my best interest. A person would move it so they'd have more land than what they righteously own. In other words, they're defrauding their neighbor. And God is saying, the principle is, you defraud people, it can produce a curse. Deuteronomy 27, 19. Cursed is the man who leads the blind astray on the road. Now, if a man leads a blind man astray, what's he doing? He's taking advantage of a handicapped person. And God says, that's going to result in a curse. My point is that these are actions that people, any one of us, could do. And it is opening a door for, for evil spirits to be able to have influence against us. That's what a curse is in this context. There's, there's many more of these. Remember, Galatians 3.10, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. The power of curses, the power of sin, and the consequences of sin has been broken provided that we apply that in our lives. If we walk around ignorant and just thinking, well, I'm holy and I'm sanctified, therefore there's no effect of sin against me, we know that's not true. 
If you go out and lie and steal, you'll feel the consequences of that sin. And what God is trying to do here with, with numerous records is he's saying, don't do this certain sinful behavior because it will, it, it, it is, what he says is, you'll be cursed. But that's kind of like code for saying, evil spirits are going to be able to enter and harass you and gain influence into your life. In the Old Testament, people did not have the same understanding of the demonic and the spiritual battle that we do. Why? Because God kept that concealed from them. It would be like having a small child and me telling them about some big uh, you know, enemy that's going to come. It would just overwhelm them. They have no power, no ability to defend themselves against that. It would do nothing but put fear and instill fear in them. On the other hand, if I said, don't do this because it's going to hurt you, well, that's a softer way of, of, of basically saying, in essence, what would happen is, you know, don't talk to, you know, just don't talk to strangers or you don't go up to strangers with a little kid. Rather than saying, don't go up to strangers because they can molest you and harm you. I mean, that's like what we say, too much information. In the Old Testament, it was almost too much information. God's people would have been overwhelmed. They didn't understand the demonic, and God in his, in his grace and mercy kept it from them. But what he did do is say, don't do the sinful behavior because it will result in harm to you. You will be cursed. We know today, now looking back, that what that curse actually is, is it's allowing the possibility of evil spirits to come in and harm a person or influence their lives. I want to read a list here, and I know it can be a little overwhelming, but I just want you to understand the depth to which a per actions can result in curses. And, and I'm not going to give scriptural reference for every one of them, although, honestly, I have them. And, you know, I've got multiple on many of these. Here's a list of some of the things that we can do that will result in a curse based on Old Testament specific records. Fornication. My goodness. Just now consider that. How much of that is happening in our present promiscuous society? Fornication can result in a curse. God says if, you, if there's incest, you're cursed. Sex with animals, you're cursed. Homosexuality, rape, children conceived out of wedlock. These all will result in a curse, and the power of those curses has to be broken. Accursed objects in your possession. That's one I've sp specifically experienced because there was a period of time I brought a lot of objects which God said, don't have those in your possession. They'll cause a curse to be upon you. And I actually felt that. I would recommend you go listen to my teaching, Cleansing the Temple. And in that, I give my specific testimony and experience concerning it. In fact, I just got a, an email from a woman earlier this week who testified to the exact same thing. Her mother had brought into the home a Buddha, a statue, and that statue had been dedicated to false uh, worship, to the worship of a false god. Resulted in harm in the home, number of years, harassing spirits, the woman prayed against this to break it off, and in that week, the Buddha statue made out of wood actually was split in two. This is, this is real stuff, and many people discount the spiritual battle, but curses are real, accursed objects are real, and as Christians, we need to stand in the power and authority that Jesus Christ has given us to defeat this stuff. Um, also, God says that anybody who curses Abraham's seed will, will be cursed. Failure to give God glory, according to Malachi, who can produce a curse. Robbing God of tithes and offerings. Now, I don't believe in the tithe today in, in, in our time period, but I do believe that we're to be generous givers. And, but God is saying, you withhold you know, giving from me, and it can result in a curse. The neglecting of the Lord wor Lord's work in Jeremiah spells out a curse. Enticing others away from the Lord and into false religions, according to Deuteronomy 13, produces a curse. Taking away or adding to the Word of God, Revelation 22, 18 and 19, that produces a curse. And the list goes on. Um, refusing to warn others of their sin, defiling the Lord's Sabbath, perverting the gospel, cursing your rulers, refusal to forgive others after asking God to forgive you. 
Matthew 18, verse 34 through 35, specifically, it results in a curse. Child sacrifice, disobedience against the Lord's commands, and the list goes on and on and on. My point being is that when we act in sinful ways, it can result in a curse, a door being opened, and evil spirits gaining influence into our lives. We need to take authority over that, repent of our sinful behavior, which means to change, renounce it, ask God for forgiveness, and rebuke it, and then move on. I mean, it's that simple. But just like in the Egyptian times, when, the, when God said, sacrifice the lamb on the, on the night of the Passover, take the blood and apply it to the doorpost, and when the destroyer comes, he'll see the blood and pass over you. In the same way, we have to apply the blood of Christ. We have to walk in the authority and power for us to remind the devil he has no authority and there is no curse that can result from any behavior that should affect us, provided that we repent and renounce and, re and rebuke it. And um, so in the next section, we're going to look on the, on, at the uh, other categories of curses that can occur. Thank you.